busy in the Internet of Things and screwing with everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about slides. I'm going to try to, I'm not going to mime a demo, but I will try to explain what we're going to see, uh, see in the demo. So the first thing that I want to show you is, uh, is how you need to classify your network in order for it to make sense. So we talked before about every single IP address that's on the network, all of a sudden we see everything they do. So we get this enormous amount of information. Every single IP address, every time they connect, every time they communicate, we get all the information about this. We see uh, which host did it connect to, which port, which... Uh, What's this? This is not my desktop either. <laughs> I have a Mac. That's a PC. That's another presentation. That's not mine. So now we've got three ghosts that are loose inside the machine. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do, it takes normally one to two days in the medium-sized networks, is to classify the different types of devices we have inside the networks. So why do we want to do that? What's the point? In order to get a good understanding about what goes on in the network, you need to compare apples to apples. If you compare the way an antivirus server behaves, with the way an exchange server behaves, with the way a surveillance camera behaves, it's going to look very strange. So the first thing we need to do, we need to sit down, maybe we have this information already, somewhere we need to find out and create what we call a host group. There's two big host groups. The first host group is everything on the outside of our networks, the internet. In that host group, there's a number of subcategories. For instance, known bad parts of the internet, known botnets, known tall network places, or other things that you might want to classify. You might also want to classify partner networks, some cloud services that you work with. There's a number of things that might be interesting to you to want to look at when it comes to the groups. On oh, here we go, fantastic. So let's just skip all the introduction that I prepared. Um, here we go. Right. <laughs> So this is what I was actually going to talk about. The first thing we need to do when we start using the network as a sensor, we need to create host groups, something that makes sense for us. We create one for the outside. Here we have a number of countries that we classify, they're classified automatically, we get this information. So if we ever want to look at the traffic coming in and out of Djibouti to our network, we can do that. So all countries that we have are automatically put into the system based on the geolocation. Right. We can also look at suspicious Bogon attacks. So Bogon network is a network which shouldn't exist because they have an IP address that hasn't been given out. So that can also be suspicious. We have things such as known bad networks, like command and control networks. We have botnets. All these are automatically configured. And maybe you want to add some others. So that's done on the outside. That takes a few minutes to set up. A lot of it is automatically in there, because when you turn your routers and your uh, uh, firewalls into sensors, they will get information about these IP addresses, and then we have them in a group. The second step that we need to take is to make sure that we classify the inside host. Because again, we need to compare apples to apples. We need to make sure that we compare our application service with other application servers in order to understand what's normal network behavior. I'm just realizing that the resolution isn't great. But what we're basically seeing is that we take the IP addresses of our different servers, the CRM service we put in one group, and we put our exchange services in another. And these groups will then take two weeks to look at what's normal behavior for these, these devices in this group. And when you've done this, when you put your information in here, you might already have it, 
or you can just quickly import it via script, suddenly you know what's normal behavior for my network. If you know what's normal behavior for an exchange server, a surveillance camera server, an internet user, a guest user, then it's a lot easier to look for anonymous. So first, we do our homework. We create, we create groups on the inside. First, we can look at uh, by type of user. So if you're a CA analyst, we put you in one group. If you work for HR, you're in another. Uh, if you are a guest, we put you in a third group. You're also going to be tied maybe to a location and a function. So one IP address can belong to many different groups. So the most simple one, for instance, if you're an exchange server, that's your function. You're also going to be in a data center, and that's going to be your location. And based on this, we can then start to use these objects that we create to look for anomalies and look at the different um, relationships between these groups. I've got two minutes ago. So, one example, uh, which I'm going to show you, is the way that you can use to make a map. So basically what we're seeing in this picture, we created a number of groups. We created one for our database. So this is actually a, uh, a map of an application that we're using. On your furthest right, we have the database. That's where the database servers link, the IPs of the, uh, of the database servers for this application. We then create uh, another group for the actual application servers that get the data from the, uh, from the database. And then we have the web server front end. So we take these three groups, we simply connect it, and we draw ourselves a map. And this map will monitor all traffic for this particular application. It will look at what's normal behavior for the database, what's normal behavior for the mid tier and the web server. And when you have any issues inside your network, this is more related to network performance monitoring than security. You've got a very simple view. If someone calls you when you sit in the network operations department, someone calls you and says, my application is slow. Then you can very, very quickly get information whether it's a traffic issue, if it's an issue of the server response times of the servers, you'll be able to see if the round trip time on the network is slow, or if it's just too much traffic or a very high packet rate. So that's around network performance and network performance management. So once you created these host groups, one of the things that you can do is create maps that make sense to you. Um, another example here of another map is just, you take the organization and we want to look at all traffic inside an organization that's leaving to other countries. So from our headquarters in the Ukraine, how much traffic do we have to uh, Bulgaria is the Europe, Russia, Federation, China, and are there any alarms associated with that traffic? You can right-click on anything and set a policy, set an alarm. So for instance, if you want to set an alarm for traffic to China, you can right-click here, and then you can say, if I see anything but web traffic and email traffic going to China, I want to have an alarm because it might be someone sending out data to China, for instance. The next step that I want to show you, we need to kind of rush through this a little bit, uh, is you remember when I talked about the before phase, when you set your policies, and then you start looking at policy violations? This is the language that we kind of build those policy violations in. So again, it's not necessarily great resolution, as you can see, um, but the way that it works, you look at the relationship between one host group and another. So for instance, there's one here about BitTorrent. Any inside host group talking to any outside host group using BitTorrent, we want to have an alarm. There's another one for Telnet. 
There's another one for traffic between certain locations. There should only be SSH traffic between these two locations, for instance. If we see anything but SSH, then we want an alarm to be raised. But the thing here is, depending on which host groups you've created, you can really build any kind of policy. It can be very basic, like no traffic to the internet for this part of the network. Or it can be very granular, so the host group ATM machines should only speak to the ATM servers inside the data center over HTTPS, and it only has to be, if it's more than one meg of traffic, then I want an alarm. So this is what we do before an attack happens. And I'm not going to move away from the old GUI to the new GUI. We moved a lot of the functionality away from this GUI into, uh, into the new GUI, which looks rather different. And it's HTML5 based. So what we're seeing in this GUI is basically, on the top, we see ongoing attacks. To your left, we see devices that got a high concern index. So we see we have three alarms with three devices that we should be concerned about, that might be doing bad things. The next one, target attacks. How many devices are currently being targeted inside the organization? We're also seeing things such as command and control. We're seeing data being uh, exported out of the network data being hoarded on a device, DDoS attack, brute force attacks, etc. So that's ongoing alarms currently at this moment. So now we moved from before an attack, where we build our policies, to this console, which all functionality will be moved to. We have some functionality still in the old one that you saw recently. Everything's going to be moved to here. And this is where we work during an attack. So during an attack, we get the information about the things that are currently going on. And we'll be able to quickly look into the alarms that we have today, for instance. Can I... Something's wrong with the resolution here. Uh, So, for instance, we see here that during the day, the other things that we see here, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the one to your furthest left with the number of bars, then we see the attacks by type going on the last five, six days. So which alarms have we been seeing over time? The pie chart in the middle is the alarms that we, has been going on the last 24 hours. And then to the right, we see the number of uh, expect of uh, ongoing. Uh, this is just the best demo I've ever done. <laughs> Nothing goes right. Fantastic. Uh, okay, I just think all that <laughs> stopped working randomly. Uh, but what I want to show you is kind of a long story. This is uh, the gods have really been against us in this case. So in this case, what I did. I looked. At, I clicked into the pie chart, which I can actually, for some reason, here we go. We can make it bigger. <coughs> and we see today we had two policy violations for data exfiltration. That's one of the key things that you might want to look out for: is someone using data in a way that they should not potentially be doing. So let's see which alarms and which users have been exporting data. So here we see that we have two different hosts with two different IP addresses. They have been the source of this alarm. These are the ones that triggered the alarm data exfiltration uh, for today. So there's two different sources. I click into uh, uh, to one of them. And here I get the information about that particular IP address. So every IP address will have, will have this dashboard. So you'll be able to see which alarms have been raised against this uh, IP address, who have they been communicating with, uh, and what has, been, uh, what has been going on. So we see over time, 
It has a number of suspicious data loss. First, it downloaded data from this IP address, and then it sent data out to the internet. We see there is currently there's only one connection ongoing, and that goes to China. So again, we have the host group China, and we see there is traffic leaving this host to China. There's nothing internal, there's no internal traffic, therefore we see nothing on the internal side. But if we click external, we see that this user has uploaded 1.17 megs to China, gigs per to China over the last 24 hours. We also see the information who is the user that's been connected to this IP. Who has connected to this IP over the last time? So currently we see it's Lucy that's logged on. She has been logged on a number of times at the same IP. So it's most likely that this is the user that we're seeing that's out uh, exfiltrating the data to the internet. If we then want to look a little bit closer and get information on what data did she send out, how much traffic and exactly where did it go, we just create a very simple we create a very simple uh, rule. We say for this host with this IP address, talking to the outside, in this case in China, uh, we run this query. And then we can look up, okay, it was Lucy on the inside. She connected to somewhere in China. She sent out 500 megs of traffic. She got 200 megs back. And then we can do a lookup on this particular host. Uh, external lookup. And then we can look it up at sender base, D Shield, or anything else to understand. We see that a lot of traffic is left in China. That's not normal. Lucy doesn't normally do that. The host group that she belongs to, users, they don't normally send out lots of data to China in this matter. So then we want to understand where is she sending the data. So let me give us quickly do a lookup and try to understand who owns this domain, etc. Okay. And the same thing goes for You'll be able to click into any single alarm that you've seen. Even if it happened a long time ago, if it happened three months, six months ago, and you'll be able to see what caused this alarm, which host was it related to, and you'll be able to see every single transaction that this host has done and filter it any way you want. So if you, for instance, is interested in, you see someone has been scanning on the network, they want to see scanning traffic from this certain IP with this specific user over the last seven days, or the last month, etc. Did it manage to touch someone? They can look into that device and track attacks and track issues inside the network as you move across. Due to the fact that we started a little bit late, uh, to say the least, um, I think I want to try to cut myself short because I know there's other presenters and it's not their fault that we had issues with the technology. Um, but I'll take a couple of questions, I suppose. So again, apologies for the very, very short demo. We wanted to do it a bit longer and go through a lot of different scenarios. Um, but I'm happy to take a few questions before I let the next person on the, uh, on the stage. No questions? Anything about technology when it comes to presenting? I can tell you all about that. Um, Shoot. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me, can we, for example, uh, check uh, some uh, uh, unusual track like DNS and uh, exfiltrating data? Sure. From DNS? Great question. So that's a very, very typical, uh, typical question that we that we get. How can we use this to, for instance, detect DNS tunneling? That's a great question. So you look at what's normal DNS traffic. And we also look, because DNS is a port and a protocol, but we also do application detection. So we can see fake application, we see the traffic is sent over DNS, over the port and the protocol that matches DNS, but the actual application does not seem to be DNS, so that will generate a fake application alarm. You will also be able to look at baselining for the way that DNS traffic looks like. So what's normal amount of DNS traffic from a host back and forth? 
it would see that someone starts to generate a lot more DNS traffic than they normally do. Again, that would be uh, fake application, data exfiltration, data hoarding, uh, fake application alarms. That will detect that. Great question. Yes. Uh, the question is, could you uh, show some example of indicator uh, how you analyze the data mm -hmm. specifically and how you find uh, some information about the event? Okay, so, so okay. that's a great question. So once you see an event and you see the, uh, see the actual, you get an alarm, you see an event, and then what you then can run is something called a flow table or a flow query, which means that you see an event, this is the host that you've seen the event associated with, and then you can see every single connection that host has made over time, and which connection this was that generated the alarms that's been generated. So you can then go in and not only look at that, but also associated flows of data. How you can find an alarm? Yeah, so the alarms are generated either by uh, the policy that you configure, then it will come up as a policy violation, or they will be generated by the algorithms. But specifically from the data, do you have some example? For example, user uh, performs some search in the internet, uh, in the network, not legal search. How you can find this? Uh, for example, we have this information in the network, and sure. this place indicates that this is okay. such yeah. Okay, so, so I think I know what the question is a little bit better, so thank you. So, for instance, if we're looking for someone doing reconnaissance in the network, we look at, take you, you're a laptop user, you belong in my organization, and normal behavior for you is to do scans and pings, maybe one or two or three, that's, that's normal. We wouldn't alert on that. But when we see that you start to do 10, 15, 20, 100 number of pings, compared to what's normal behavior for you, then we're gonna fire an alarm saying we've seen you scan ping over TCP and UDP 50 times now. If you do it once or twice, we think it might be normal, maybe just a small thing. But once you start to aggressively scan, that will stand up compared to what's normal behavior for you, and what's normal behavior for everyone else in the group that you belong to. So you belong to the group users, or laptop users. And then we compare the way that you scan, ping, etc., from your laptop compared to everyone else. What if uh, there are so many groups and uh, it is complex to specify or for each specific group what is a normal behavior? Yes, yeah, so you create a manageable amount of groups, not too many, not too few. So there is best practices that we share with our customers. How many groups and which groups it makes sense to create. Because you don't want a million groups, like you say, you want a manageable amount of groups. Um, so, so there is guidelines for how to create the groups and which groups it makes sense to base like. And do you have... Uh specific list of all alarms? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I think I already gave you my card, so just send me an email and I'm happy to send that to you. Of all the alarms and all the algorithms and, and everything is very well documented, it's on cisco.com as well. Can the user identify their own types of alarms? If you want to give them access in the console to do that, yes. But normally you don't give them access, you monitor everything they do. Uh, you don't want them to, to see themselves on the, on the uh, CCTV screen. Uh, so you monitor them. Of course, if you want to give them access, you can. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yes. So do we need to wrap up? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So there's two types of DDoS attacks. These volumetric ones, they're incredibly easy to detect. We just see lots of traffic hitting that router. That's fine. When it comes to application-based DDoS attacks, they are a lot harder because then you work at the number of connections instead and those kind of things. 
So the traffic doesn't go up, but we see that it's not more traffic, but there's more connections. So we both track, we have both, we have two alarms, one for volumetrics, when we see incoming traffic to a router or a firewall, when that goes up, from X amount of IP addresses, we, we start to understand which one are pounding us with data and that will generate a volumetric DDoS attack alarm. Then we have application-based ones as well. Then we see the number of connections going up, not the traffic, but that particular uh, application generates a, lot more, generates a lot more connections than normal, and that's how we detect application-based DDoS. And these are the tricky ones. But we don't mitigate, so we send it to a scrubbing center, uh, like a DDoS mitigation solution. There are also Cisco price list to take care of the actual scrubbing of the, uh, of the IPs that are attacking. Yes? Um, can uh, translate in Russian? Sure. Volodymyr, uh, could you translate? Yes, yes. Uh, um, now, uh, in the next part of the process, uh, в общем, первый вопрос я был на пресс-конференции IBM, и там у них был похожий продукт, назывался Искотан. Он базировался на том, что и происходит. Можно сначала? В сентябре была конференция IBM, и там как раз у них был похожий продукт, как там ваш, и назывался он Искотан. Он базировался на определенном анализе метрик. То бишь берется определенное количество метрик, клиент за них платит деньги, и IBM их анализирует. Я хотел бы узнать, какие у вас, в принципе, скажем так, алгоритмы, есть такие моменты, как вот такой же анализ метрики, какие преимущества непосредственно вашего продукта перед тем же IBM-ским и экспортаром. И также есть форс, да, в анализе, там, в основном, второй продукт проходит по уязвимости и сборе их, а потом уже, нет, он не передавались от экспортара и экспорт. Okay, so uh, that, the, basically the questions that I received, only if you speak Russian, so you will not uh, understand what he said. Now I do as well, because the translator uh, translated. So the, the question is basically, how do we compare with other solutions, such as Curator, who, who does DDoS mitigation and, and DDoS detection, etc. Um, they have certain parts of their solution, they're a SIM tool, basically, uh, mainly a SIM solution, security, incident, and event monitoring. They have certain features that look at NetFlow that we also look at, but it's fairly light by comparison, and the number of, uh, the number of algorithms, etc., aren't really comparable. So for them, it's a function of a SIM tool, a solution, while for us, it's uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the whole purpose of why we exist. So a SIM tool works on Syslog, we work on NetFlow. Every single customer that I have, they have a SIM tool, it could be Curator, HP Oxide, Splunk, uh, Low Rhythm, or any of the others. Some of them have small feature sets that kind of moves in a little bit to what we do, but they're not competitors, uh, because 99% we, we complement what they do. Yes. Okay, we need to go. Sorry. Should I take the last question or no? Okay, last question. Last question. Very, very quick. Uh, what if we have an issue when our data is sent into different uh, IP addresses located in different countries, not particularly in China, but maybe all around the world? Sure. Okay, that's a great question because we see every single country. So you can just create your exfiltration alert. You don't need to say specifically to China. You don't need to specifically configure a, a policy, don't send lots of data to China. Because automatically, when we see traffic being sent out, we'll automatically alert to it. But in the Middle East, for instance, where I live, many customers are worried about Israel, for instance. So they put a specific policy, say, when traffic moves to Israel, then I want to know about it specifically, extra much, even if it's just a little bit of data. But the normal algorithms will look independent of country. And when you get information about traffic having left the, day, left the network, a part of the information you will see is which country did it leave to, which IP address in that country, they can do a look up on that ID. So again, thank you so much for your time, and apologies for the, uh, for the issues that we had with the demo ghosts, or the three demo ghosts. Okay, okay. Second part. Uh,
специалисты с международно признанной квалификацией CCNA способны проектировать, настраивать, а также эксплуатировать компьютерные сети и соответствующее оборудование как небольших предприятий, так и огромных интернет-провайдеров. Среди них можешь оказаться и ты. Начни свою карьеру инженера сетевых технологий в IT-сфере вместе с Cisco.